Welcome to the Grassroots Health webinar series, Scientists Answer Your Questions. This is Carol Baggerly, and this week we are hearing from Dr. Stefan Pills of the Department of Internal Medicine at Graz, Austria. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing him at the Linus Pauling Institute's Diet and Optimum Health Conference. Dr. Pills made a marvelous presentation on vitamin D and cardiovascular disease, and that was the topic of our interview. Please stay tuned for his conversation with me, and then we will close and tell you about next week. Thanks so very much. All right, today we are here with Dr. Pills, a vitamin D researcher from Austria, and at the Linus Pauling Conference, and we are going to be talking about cardiovascular disease and vitamin D. He made a marvelous presentation yesterday on it. And Dr. Pills, I would just like for you right now to summarize some of the key things that you think everybody ought to know about vitamin D and cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Um, first of all, vitamin D deficiency is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular diseases and cardiovascular events. We've shown this in large meta-analysis that a low level of vitamin D puts you at high risk for cardiovascular events. And uh, the second thing is we also have some RCTs on cardiovascular risk factors. We have um, quite good data for blood pressure. We need even more, but uh, evidence is quite suggestive that there could be some relevant effects on blood pressure. Uh, the same also for type 1 and type 2 diabetes but it's uh, still not the time to draw a final conclusion on that, so uh, there could be some relevant effects there, but at present uh, we don't know uh, exactly. And uh, regarding treatment of vitamin D, um, it's uh, the problem that we have at present no RCD that was specifically designed to um, report on vitamin D supplementation effects on cardiovascular events. Um, but uh, we still need more. We still need more data on that. But evidence overall is uh, quite good. And with regard to cardiovascular disease, vitamin D is also when we supplement it in a, in a normal range, in a normal dose, it's 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 relatively safe. So we have not really indication that we have uh, harms with with high doses of vitamin D, at least in the trials that uh, that uh, have already been published on that. You also mentioned, back again to the blood pressure thing, do you have any information at all as to what the, the size of the effect yeah, on blood pressure is? We have um, at least four meta-analysis reporting on blood pressure effects of vitamin D, and the effect size is in a range of 2 to 6 millimeters mercury, uh, which is of clinical relevance, because we know even if it's just low blood pressure by 2 millimeters mercury, this should translate into mortality reduction by 3%. So, but we need we need more trials, and we're just uh, doing one trial in in Austria on blood pressure effects of vitamin D. So, hopefully, in the future, we will have more data on that. The impact of it, it's interesting that the two millimeters of mercury could make a difference, but it does at a population level. Yeah, it's enormous, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it is. And, um, so, this is uh, one of my. Uh, most important points I look at uh, on vitamin D and cardiovascular disease to look at the blood pressure effects. So mm -hmm. if that is really true, Let's this could be Sorry. an explanation for, for beneficial effects with regard to outcome, with regard to mortality. So I think this is uh, very important. In terms of your own research, tell me, uh, is your focus entirely on cardiovascular um, and vitamin D, or what else do you look at? Yeah. I mean, just explain a little more about what uh, you do. I mean, it's mainly epidemiological studies, mm -hmm. uh, identifying vitamin D deficiency as a risk factor mm -hmm. for cardiovascular events, and uh, also some small RCTs on blood pressure one, but uh, we also did some studies on uh, the immune system, on regulatory T cells, so that are cells that are considered to protect against autoimmunity, and we saw a significant increase in these regulatory T cells uh, with vitamin D supplementation, and this could be some kind of an explanation why vitamin D could protect against autoimmune diseases. And I think we have such as such as type one diabetes. I think okay. we have very good data. Uh, from observational studies on type 1 diabetes 
um, when asking um, parents uh, whether they supplemented vitamin D in their children. Uh, there was a large study in Finland by Elina Hüppenen and she could actually show that those parents who uh, did supplement uh, as recommended, they had a five-fold low risk for type 1 diabetes compared to those with a lower dose than recommended. So I think we have good evidence for that and we also have a lot of mechanistic data on that and uh, vitamin D could really work on autoimmunity and particularly on type 1 diabetes. There was a presentation done by Dr. Frank Garland, which is recorded on the Grassroots Wealth website a couple of years ago, about type 1 diabetes in Finland today. Yeah. And what it showed very clearly was as Finland changed yeah. their uh, health recommendations for intake of vitamin D, to be something much lower, like they're down now at the 400 uh, IU per day for infants, their type 1 diabetes skyrocketed. Yeah. Uh, would you comment on that? Yeah, I think this, uh, I'm, I'm aware of that data, and I think they, as they went down with the recommendations, type 1 diabetes increased. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's that fits together with all the hypotheses that we have on type 1 diabetes and vitamin D. But uh, doing a trial, prevention trial for type 1 diabetes uh, means a lot of work, means decades of But do, of we really need, do we really need to do a trial? I mean, yeah. isn't the evidence on type 1 diabetes sufficiently compelling and the fact that vitamin D is safe yeah, enough think, to take some action yeah. and get going? I think it's, it's, we have good levels of evidence for type 1 diabetes. But something I always mention is that uh, we just need one reason for vitamin D supplementation and uh, there is a general acceptance that we have beneficial effects for skeletal health and uh, this is the only reason we need why we should supplement vitamin D, why we should prevent vitamin D deficiency. If there are other reasons why it is good, is it for type 1 diabetes or for cardiovascular disease, blood pressure, cancer, it's even better, but uh, we just need one reason, the evidence is there to uh, prevent and treat vitamin D deficiency. And uh, Personally, I believe we have an effect on type 1 diabetes, uh, but as a scientist, I have to say we still need more data on that. I think that's the proper role of scientists. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I attended a, a research program some years ago where after several days of talking about the benefits of vitamin D mm. in cancer, I was rather struck by the urgency of getting the message out and the answer by a panel of the scientists of where do we go from here is more research. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't argue, but there's also this getting the message out that's yeah. really important. Yeah. I like the idea that if there's one condition that you can firmly identify, mm -hmm. uh, like bone health, yeah. uh, that is necessary. And that level that we hear is at least at the 32 nanogram per milliliter range, 75 nanomoles per liter. And when people enter our project, our study, at least half of them are even below that. Uh, the world at large is really quite deficient. What can we do to speed up the process from your perspective? Yeah, I, think, I think there's not one, one solution sure. for, for eradication of vitamin D deficiency. We should uh, use different approaches, which means um, uh, on the one hand, of course, food fortification, mm -hmm. supplements, do you do food fortification in Austria? I no, mean, some do places not. do not. We do not in Austria. Not at all? Yes. Uh, there are some foodstuffs that contain some vitamin D, but uh, uh, and generally it's, it's, it's not really arrived there. We have some in Finland, okay. in Europe, okay. uh, but it didn't work very well. They evaluated after they introduced that, and the increase in 25D levels was uh, not as expected, let's say. But I think... Um, Food fortification will not solve the problems, supplements alone will not solve the problems, right. and changing lifestyle not. So we need an approach that incorporates all of these three things to, to increase vitamin D uh, levels in the population. And we're working on this, and <laughs> hopefully in the European Union there will be more food fortification for vitamin D. That's my hope for the future. 
I think the evidence is there to do that, mm -hmm. and uh, that is one approach, but it's not the solution for, for everything, yeah. for the whole problem of vitamin yeah. D deficiency. There was even a, there have been a number of papers come out recently from the UK indicating that, oh my goodness, maybe just a little bit more sun exposure would help, mm -hmm. which is of course the original source of yeah. our vitamin yeah. D. <laughs> There's another, um, I don't know that one would call it food fortification, but it's an interesting thing that's actually happening here in the United States. Um, the feed for chickens, for beef, for whatever, is fortified with vitamin D. And specifically for chickens, yeah. um, there is even more that is being given to them nowadays, and eggs now have a not insubstantial, insubstantial amount of uh, vitamin D in them. Uh, and the other thing that's very notable as a consumer is that the egg shells of these eggs are harder. They get back again to the calcium and, and the bone health of the chickens. It seems like maybe even the chickens are healthier. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, the, the word is biofortification mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. vitamin D, and mm -hmm. uh, there are different uh, ways to do it. I think there are um, some approaches to, to put sunlight on fish. Mm -hmm. to increase the mm -hmm. vitamin D levels and so on. I think this is uh, a very good approach to do it, to mm -hmm. increase the vitamin mm -hmm. D in mm -hmm. natural foods. Mm -hmm. And I hope this will arrive in Europe. Oh, soon. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, any yeah. other key things we should look to or pay attention to in the future for cardiovascular health and vitamin D? So you think what, what are the most important issues that should be addressed? Yes. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, I think we need we need large trials okay. <laughs> and, and more data, but uh, as outlined in my talk yesterday, I think that uh, the large trials that are ongoing, um, um, I really appreciate what the investigators do there, but I think that the uh, selection of the patients, of the study participants, was not ideal to, to study real relevant effects of vitamin D, because most of these trials, or almost all of these trials, included the participants, regardless of 25-hydroxyvitamin D status, they allowed it. And all of them aren't even condition. measuring yeah. at the baseline level. They don't even know what yeah. they have. But they don't uh, really focus on the deficient individuals, and they allow supplement intake in a placebo group. Mm -hmm. So I think this will be a problem to, to assess uh, relevant vitamin D effects. I mean, mm -hmm. we will have a lot of data on safety, so we know what happens when we supplement the whole population, the whole older population, but uh, I fear that um, the inclusion of a lot of patients or participants with sufficient vitamin D levels will inflate any significant effect or any relevant effect mm -hmm. of, of vitamin mm -hmm. D. Mm -hmm. So hopefully there will be further studies that try to assess or evaluate effects of vitamin D mm -hmm. in those populations that are most sensitive to vitamin D. And mm -hmm. I think these are, of mm -hmm. course, the deficient populations, but also individuals that are at a certain risk for whatever I want to study. Sure. Is it diabetes? Is it blood yeah. pressure? And hopefully these studies will come up. And because I fear that vitamin D could repeat the stories of other vitamins like vitamin E and so on, what it did exactly the same, doing large trials in the entire population and not looking at what are sensitive individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope that more trials are coming up. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking your time yes. now, and I look forward to talking with you more during the conference. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure for me, and uh, congratulations for all your efforts you do for vitamin D. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for your participation in this series today. We are honored to have so many of these great scientists on our D-Action panel. At this time, we're also actively recruiting sponsors for this webinar series. So I would encourage you to log on to this link to make a contribution or to sponsor a session. Next week, we will have the honor of interviewing Dr. Adrian Gombart of the Linus Pauling Institute. He will share with us uh, more about his work with vitamin D and the immune system function. Please join us next week for this session.